Good evening. I um, hope everyone can hear me all right. Welcome to our knee replacement webinar with Dr. Chris Ferguson. We will get started momentarily, but first I want to just take a moment to explain our format tonight. In a minute, I will introduce Dr. Ferguson and he will present on our topic. In order to keep background noise down, all participants will be muted throughout the presentation. Um, and if you find yourself not being muted um, for any reason, if you could go ahead and mute yourself, I would, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, the presentation is being recorded and it will be shared on our website, hopefully tomorrow. Um, if not, latest will be Monday um, afternoon. Uh, all that said, we do welcome questions. So please feel free um, to send your questions to the host via the chat feature on your Zoom toolbar. It is usually found at the bottom or perhaps on the side of your screen. Um, at the end of Dr. Ferguson's presentation, we'll open the floor for questions. We have collected a few ahead of the webinar and we may start with those. Um, we'll then go into the order of questions received during the event. If for some reason we have more questions than time to answer, or you don't feel your question has been answered, I'm going to be sure to collect the unanswered questions and I'll post responses along with the video when we share it, or I'll follow up with you directly. So uh, now I would like to introduce Dr. Ferguson. Dr. Ferguson is a dual board certified orthopedic surgeon specializing in sports medicine and orthopedic surgery. He treats a variety of musculoskeletal problems and focuses on arthroscopic knee and shoulder surgery, fractures, and joint replacement surgery. Dr. Ferguson earned his medical degree from the University of Mississippi School of Medicine. He also completed an AO International Trauma Fellowship in Schur, Switzerland with Dr. Christoph Sommer. When he's not at work, Dr. Ferguson enjoys spending time with his family, reading and participating in outdoor sports. Dr. Ferguson is married with three daughters, he serves as the team orthopedic surgeon for St. Mary's Episcopal School and Brighton High School. He is a certified shooting instructor and is a coach for the nationally ranked St. Mary's High School trap shooting team. He is also currently serving on the Engineering Advisory and Advancement Council for the Ole Miss School of Engineering. As you can see, he's a busy guy, but he still found time to sit down with us tonight and discuss some neat advancements in knee replacement surgery. So without further ado, take it away, Dr. Ferguson. All right, thank you. And uh, thanks, Melissa, for the introduction. And thanks to everyone for joining the webinar. Um, my name is Chris Ferguson. I'm an orthopedic surgeon with OrthoSouth. Uh, just a little bit about our organization. We have 35 physicians with eight clinics, um, including two surgery centers. We have regular weekday hours, as well as extended after hour care. Uh, at uh, several locations. We have a Saturday clinic. We have, uh, in particular, 19 knee specialists with nine joint replacement specialists. And we offer a wide range of care from conservative management to injection therapy to arthroscopic surgery all the way to knee replacement. And we'd be happy to see you as a patient. With that being said, we're going to move into the talk tonight on uh, specifically cementless knee replacement surgery. And there have been a number of knee replacement surgery changes over the last five to 10 years, changes and advancements in anesthesia with, with different types of blocks and pain management. Uh, we've transitioned a lot of these surgeries now to the outpatient setting. Um, there's robotic uh, knee replacement. There's MRI-based knee replacement surgery with, with patient-matched cutting blocks. Um, but we're going to try to focus the talk tonight on primarily cementless, uh, also known as biologic fixation knee replacement. And this is a, a variation of knee replacement that uses an alternative fixation method that's becoming popular for several reasons. Um, one is patients that need knee replacement surgery are uh, living longer. Uh, they're younger than they used to be. Um, they're staying active longer, and also patients are, are heavier. As you know, there's an uh, increasing rate of obesity in the country, and so, so young active patients and heavy patients put high demands on knee replacement uh, or knee implants. And for that reason, uh, many orthopedic surgeons are now turning to 
this biologic fixation knee in order to allow patients to uh, remain more active and also to do these uh, joint replacements in a wider range of patients. So just to talk about knee replacement in general before we get into the specifics of the, the, the cementless knees. Knee replacement surgery is a, a surgical procedure that is um, basically to replace the damaged uh, joint surfaces of the knee. So as, as knees start to wear out, the, arth the, the arthritic changes occur in which the cartilage starts to wear out and you have uh, eventually bone rubbing on bone within the knee, which generates pain and swelling and stiffness and, and all of the dysfunction that um, goes with knee arthritis. So commonly knee joints are damaged by arthritis, either osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or a traumatic injury that leads to arthritis through damage to the joint. Knee replacement surgery becomes an option once conservative treatment has failed. And so conservative treatment can consist of, you know, anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, cortisone injections, uh, the visco supplementation, we also, also call gel shots. Um, but once all those things fail to control pain, then we move into uh, discussions on knee replacement. So this is a little animation. So there's no blood. There's, this is just a, basically a computer uh, uh, animation that shows the knee replacement process. We'll go through that just so that you can kind of see what, what's involved. So basically go down through the, the skin and the muscles and get down to the bone. And you can see these two joint, joints here. So this upper bone is the femur, the bottom bone is the tibia. We'll sort of play this again because it runs a little bit fast, but this is sort of the process in a nutshell. Um, let me rewind here and we'll sort of pause it so that we can see what all's going on here. So stop it here. So this upper bone here is the, the thigh bone or the femur and the bottom bone here is the tibia or the, the, the leg bone. And so the joint in between is the knee joint. And typically these joints are covered with a thick layer of cartilage that provides cushion so that when these bones, uh, when the knee moves, these bon bones rub against each other, there's not pain present. So as this arthritic process evolves and the cartilage wears away, the exposed bone underneath the cartilage uh, causes pain as this, this friction occurs between the bones. So what we do is we resurface the, the, the joints. So a lot of people come in, they ask questions, and just in talking with patients, there's a, a misconception that we just go in there and basically take the whole knee joint out, that we you know come up here and, and cut the bone up here, and we cut the bone down here, and we put this big metal hinge in there. That's really not what we do with, with knee replacement surgery. Um, you can see here, we'll let it play a little bit more. All right, so you can see the ends of the bone now have been cut. And so we make these cuts on the end of the bone that correspond to the inside of these joints, uh, these implants that we put in place. And so what we're really doing is just resurfacing the ends of the bone so that we have something that's uh, covering the ends of the bone and when people move the knee or walk on the knee, you don't have bone rubbing on bone. All right, so these are the implants. This upper implant you see here is called the femoral component, and that is a kind of a C-shaped component that covers the end of the, the femur, which is round. The tibia is a flat surface bone, so the, the tibial implant, as we can see here, is a, is a flat component. And this white piece you see in between is called the, the tibial uh, insert or the spacer. And it's made of a, a type of kind of high grade plastic, space age plastic that has uh, very durable wear characteristics and is designed to last for a long time. But that's, that's in a nutshell what is involved in knee replacement surgery. All right, so traditional knee replacement surgery. Uh, it's been routinely performed since about 1968. It uses bone cement to bond the implants to bone. So when you saw on that animation where the, the metal parts were sort of joining with the bone, the way that traditional knee replacement works is a bone cement is used to bond those components to the bone. It's currently the gold standard. It's a great surgery and it has a, a, an excellent track record uh, over long, you know, many, many years. And it is without question the best option in patients with 
poor bone quality, osteoporosis, uh, bone cysts or bone defects. But one of the downsides or one of the, the reasons that uh, we've explored these other fixation techniques such as the, the cementless knee is that bone cement is a material that has mechanical properties and it can degrade over time. So typically we see about after about 15 years or so, you can start to see this bone cement starting to break down. And in particular, it breaks down in a couple of different populations more so than others. So in, in young active patients and in heavy patients, those two subsets of patients have a higher incidence of early failure and loosening, which requires going back into the knee and replacing them. So, you know, people ask all the time, well, how long does knee replacement last? So, you know, when I was in my training and finishing up my training, we typically told people kind of 12 to 15 to, you know, 16 years, something like that. Now we're seeing, you know, more in the 15, 20, hopefully longer, 20 plus years with traditional knee replacement. So still a very good surgery. You know, if you've had a cemented knee, absolutely nothing wrong with it. That's, uh, you know, you should get many, many years of, of, uh, uh, of use out of that knee. So cementless knee replacement. So what are the advantages and what exactly is that? So cementless knee replacement avoids the use of bone cement altogether. It uses biologic fixation via bone ingrowth into highly porous metals. So basically the backside, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures and models of the, of the cementless knee implants in a moment, but, but basically the surfaces that connect to the bone, if you look at those under a microscope, it looks sort of like coral or you know, it's got little channels in which the bone can actually grow into that. And so once that bone grows into that, it actually becomes part of the, part of the bone. And so there's no cement involved. There's no, that you know, removes a, a potential point of failure there. And so we're thinking that this will lead to increased longevity of the implants in both those young active patients and also larger patients and, and patients with a BMI of greater than 35 in particular. So there's something, there's a concept called Wolf's Law, which uh, was worked out in the 19th century by a German scientist. And what Wolf's Law states is that bone that is under stress adapts to that stress. So the more stress that is put on bone, the stronger that bone becomes. We see the converse as well. So patients that are, uh, you know, bed bound or bedridden, their bones actually start to become weaker over time. So this is actually a, a Wolf's Law is actually a benefit to the cementless knee because basically says, as you put more stress on this knee, the bone gets stronger as opposed to with a cemented knee, as you put more stress on a cemented knee, it's gonna put more stress on the cement and potentially uh, cause failure over time. So fewer points of failure. So, so remember with a cemented knee, you've got that cement has to stick to two surfaces. It has to stick or bond to the bone and it also has to adhere to the implant. So you have two potential points of failure uh, with each implant. So it can, it can loosen at the bone cement interface or it can loosen at the cement implant interface. With a cementless knee, once that bone grows to the metal, then that's basically the only, only interface that could potentially fail. Um, another benefit of cementless knee replacement is that there is less bone loss in revision surgery. So revision surgery is when we have to go into the knee for some reason and basically change the parts. And that can be for loosening, it can be for infection, you know, several reasons. Um, in, infection in particular, so if a knee gets infected, that's a, that's a big problem, obviously. We, we do all the things that we know to do to avoid that, but unfortunately, we'll never be able to eradicate infection 100%. There'll always be uh, some cases of infection right now, nationwide, the average is about 1%. So fairly low probability of, of ending up with an infected knee, but still happens. But when you're dealing with an infected knee, when you take those implants out in order to treat the infection, you have to get all of the bone cement out as well, because that can leave behind infection. And sometimes that can be a really tedious process of trying to remove all this uh, this bone cement that's stuck to the bone and, and you typically lose some additional bone by taking all of that out. So the idea with the cementless knee is that you, you won't have to deal with the cement removal at all. So, so theoretically you're going to lose less bone uh, during that 
procedure. And the percentage of cementless total knee replacement is increasing. So I, I started doing this surgery back in 2017, April 2017. Um, and each year since then, I've pretty much doubled the number of cases that I've done cementless. I still do quite a few cemented knees. Uh, we still have many patients that that's the, the best option for. But over the last uh, three years or so, I've done about 160 of them and have had good results. So these, this is a picture of the implants. So again, you can kind of see those familiar uh, implants that you saw earlier on the animation. So you have the, the top implant here, which is the, the femoral component. This is the tibial component, uh, the, the tibial tray here. This is the kneecap, which you really didn't see on that animation, but we also resurfaced the, the kneecap, the, the backside of what we call the patella. We're gonna look in a moment at this in particular. So this is the, this, this under surface here on the tibial component. You also see the, the, the inner surface of the uh, femoral component. Those are the surfaces where the, bo the bone ingrows into the prosthesis. All right, so what are the important design features of the cementless knee. So there's a couple of things that have to occur with the cementless knee for it to be a success. So the first thing that has to happen is that we have to achieve initial mechanical stability, meaning we, these implants have to remain stable in the knee until the bone actually grows to it. So that's a, a tough thing to achieve, particularly on that tibia, the, the upper leg bone, where it's a flat surface. So you're trying to get a a flat piece of metal basically to stick to a flat surface until the bone can grow into it. And there, there are a few things that are done to um, make that happen. So the first thing is this, this thing called the keel. And you can see it's kind of this big triangular shaped piece. And there, you know, this is actually also present on a cemented knee. But what we do is we make a little trough basically in the, in the top of the tibia that's, that's, the same shape of, as this, but it's just slightly undersized so that when we implant this down into the bone, this gets kind of a wedge fit. So it, it's a press fit in there. The other thing you can see are these pegs. So there's four pegs on the, on the cementless knee that I use, and you can see they're kind of a, a plus shape. You don't, it's not a great, it can't see it hundred percent, but basically there's, it's kind of a plus shape here. And when they were designing this knee, they looked at a bunch of different configurations, round pegs and square pegs and triangular pegs and all kinds of shapes. And in the computer modeling and testing, they found that this cruciform shape gave the best stability. So that's a, a second form of fixation. Also, the, the undersurface of this, if you, if you rub your finger along that surface, it's rough, almost like a sandpaper. So that's it's called the increased coefficient of friction. So that, that increased friction surface there uh, resist that tray moving and keeps it still while the bone is trying to, to grow in into it. Um, okay, so the the porous coating though this this undersurface is really the 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 secret to the cementless knee replacement and and the advances in technology um, over the last years, particularly with computer aided design and computer manufacturing and, and 3D printing, which we'll talk later about. That's really what has made this, this new generation of cementless knees successful. Cementless knees were tried back in the you know, 80s and 90s and didn't have a great track record back then, mainly because they couldn't figure out a way to, to make this, uh, this bone ingrowth surface really work successfully. They tried uh, screws and, and different ways of trying to achieve that stability and it just, didn't work as well as we would have liked it to. All right, so here is a magnified picture of, of that surface. So if you look on the left side of the screen, you see what's called cancellous bone. So that's what bone looks like under a microscope on that surface where we're trying to get these, these implants to adhere to. And on the right side, you can see a magnified picture of that surface underneath the implant. So they look very similar. And, and the 
hard thing to accomplish is to get these pore sizes. So these little openings where the bone grows, have to, those pores have to be of a certain size for the bone to grow to it. And in, in years past, when they were trying to make this work, they just couldn't reliably um, make these pore sizes uniform. And, um, you know, with the, the advances in technology and the 3D printing and the computer-aided design, um, this has been successful. All right, so just what, what do these look like in the body? So this is actually a patient of mine that on the uh, left side of your screen, her right knee, but it's if you're, as you're facing it, it's on your left side. So that's a submitted knee that I did back in uh, January of 2018. So this was about six months after I, even, after I started doing cementless knees. This, this patient was in her early 60s. And, and when I first started doing this, I was only doing the cementless knees in patients that were in their 50s. Um, but she's done well with this knee. As you can see, this is a, cement, a cemented, cemented knee. You can see the, the little hazy outline right here. That's the bone cement that is adhering to the implant and also into the bone. On the right side of your screen is a cementless knee. And this was put in in August of 2018. So about nine months later, um, patient had very, very good bone quality. I talked to her before surgery and said, hey, we've been doing some of these cementless knees. You know, you had a cemented knee on the right. You did well with it. You know, what do you think about doing a cementless knee and, and see how that one performs? And she was, she was fine with it. She's now... Two years out, um, it's done well. Both knees are, the motion is the same, function is the same, uh, has no pain in either knee. She's very happy with both of them. She really can't tell any difference in the two. Um, but this is what they, they look like. You can kind of see the, the keel here. These are the pegs that we talked about earlier. This is a video. So let me back up for a second. So. We talked earlier about 3D printing, and I know a bunch of people are saying, what the heck is 3D printing? What does that mean? Is it like a computer printer? Is it, you know, how does that thing work? So really what 3D printing is, is it's a, it's construction of a 3D model from a computer design by something called additive manufacturing. You know, I think of it as like Legos. So you basically start, you're trying to build whatever, an airplane out of Legos and you start with a base layer and you put down your Legos and then you add another layer and another layer and, and you follow a pattern and you create this, whatever this 3D design that you're trying to build out of Legos. So I'll show you a video that's really neat that shows how these uh, tibial trays are made uh, through, through the 3D printing uh, process. All right, so you can see they're, they're designing the 3D model here. And then they start with this base that lays down these titanium particles, one layer at a time. The laser comes along and fuses them. And then it lays down another layer of particles and does the same thing. And it repeats this over and over. If you look on the right side of your screen, you're seeing these little tibial trays being created one layer at a time. And once they get finished, they're going to, kind of get rid of the excess material and you're going to be left with these trays. That's a whole bunch of them. What is it? Six or 12 there. And then after they're completed, they use this little caliper to test all the design surfaces to make sure that they're perfect. All right, so outcomes of cementless total knees. So there have been a lot of studies um, comparing cementless knees versus cemented knees. Um, so far, they've not shown any significant differences in post-op pain, blood loss, or function. There is an advantage in that there's a reduction in OR time um, simply because that you don't, so the cement, bone cement takes about, you know, 15 minutes or so to cure. So you're eliminating that process. 
Um, 15 minutes is not a huge amount of time, but really there's no benefit to longer OR time. So the longer you're in the OR, the higher the complication rate, higher risk of infection. So if you can eliminate time, that's, that's always a good thing as long as you're not compromising you know, the result. The post-op protocol is the same. So I'll let my patients, whether they have a cemented knee or a uncemented knee, I'll let them do the exact same thing. They're, they can weight bear from the get-go. You know, we're doing these in the surgery center. In fact, I did, did one of these this morning in the surgery center and the patients, you know, recover for, you know, a couple hours and work with physical therapy and they go home. Um, high reported patient satisfaction. The studies in the early and midterm Studies have shown good implant survivorship. Um, you know, we don't have 20 years of follow-up on these knees yet. And so it'll be, it'll be for me, you know, I've been doing them three years. It's going to take, you know, another 17 years to get 20 years of follow-up. But, but the results we have so far are encouraging. And because the fixation is through bone growing to the implant, we would expect if these are going to fail, we would expect that to occur fairly early on. Once the bone grows to the implant, it's, it's stable and we would expect it to last for many, many years. Um, there are good clinical and radiographic outcomes reported. In fact, there was a, a review article that was just published last week in something called the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, which is sort of our big peer-reviewed orthopedic journal. And this study looked at um, 8,187 cementless knees with a average follow-up of seven years post-op. And the overall revision rate uh, for loosening was about 1%, which is comparable to modern cement, uh, cemented knees. Again, so this is encouraging. If they fail, we expect these to fail early. And it just so far in the five to seven year range, it does not look like they're, they're failing any more frequently than the uh, cemented knees. So what's, what's the kind of the upshot? What, what do we expect with this? So total hip replacement sort of went through this process, you know, 12 or 15 years ago. When I was in my training during that time frame, we did about 50% of our total hips were cemented femoral, the part that goes into the femur, the, the uh, thigh bone, those were cemented and about 50% were uncemented. Well, over, over the last 12 to 15 years, total hips have pretty much transitioned to uh, completely non-submitted hips. So uh, I would expect, you know, today there were probably, I don't know, 20 or 30 total hips done in the city of Memphis. I would be surprised if any of those hips were, were submitted hips. And so I expect the same thing to occur over the next probably four to five years. I think by that time, you're going to see 50% or more of the total needs will be cementless knees. All right, so that's the, the formal presentation and be happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ferguson. Um, we actually have had several questions come, th come through. Um, so at this point, uh, I will be moderating those questions and sending them over to Dr. Ferguson. And um, I don't know, Dr. Ferguson, if you would like to uh, show your face, um, yeah, let me stop the screen sharing here. None of the rest of us have to, just you. <laughs> All right, there I am. All right, uh, so the first question is, um, the cemented knee overall recovery seems to be approximately six weeks. How long is recovery is recovery with the cementless version? Recovery is, is uh, basically exactly the same. And so I get a lot of questions about recovery and recovery is a tricky question because it's not, there's not a simple answer. So recovery is in phases. Um, the first couple of weeks, it, you know, the knee is going to be sore and swollen and you're walking on a walker and you're in physical therapy, which is not a lot of fun early on. And so most people, you're not having the, the best time during the first couple of weeks. By six weeks, most people have sort of gotten through the worst of it. They've gone through most of their therapy. They're sort of starting to feel, um, you know, kind of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, feeling better. Um, it's, it's probably three months before you really start to feel kind of more normal. You're sleeping better. You're walking with a you know more normal gait and 
uh, really doing well by that point. But as I tell all of my patients, you know, it's really nine months or even a year before you are as good as you're going to get. You can still get uh, improvement in your strength, your ability to climb t uh, stairs, how far you can walk. And so it's a, the, the short answer for full recovery from knee replacement, you're, you're still looking at nine, to nine months to 12 months, but there's no difference really between the, the cemented and cementless. Um, is there an age where cementless knee is not an option? Um, not, not, uh, not a hard cutoff, but it really has to do with the bone quality. Um, as I said, when I first started doing this, I was, I was very careful. I didn't, I didn't want to, uh, push it too much as far as, you know, getting into to someone with, with soft bones. So I really had a cutoff of about age, you know, 60 or so, but, as I've gotten more familiar with it and, um, you know, we, we have, whenever I do one of these knees, I, I have cemented implants available and I have cementless and I'll wait till I actually see the quality of the bone. And as long as the bone quality is, is good, then theoretically the cementless knee will work. Now, you know, is there reason to, to you know, you have a patient that's in their seventies, is there a reason to do a cementless knee? Probably not. I mean, you know, the cemented, cemented knees are lasting, you know, 20 years or so. So there's really not a lot of benefit to doing a cementless knee in, in a patient necessarily in their 70s, though you probably could do that. Uh, the next question, uh, have these been done by others for a longer time or is three years about the norm so far? Um, the knee that I use, Dr. Knee, um, I think it was first used commercially in 2014. So I, I did not start using it immediately. I wanted to sort of watch it for a couple of years. There's some others that uh, were involved in the, the development of the knee. We started using it, you know, as parts of studies earlier than that. Um, but um, so, yeah, I hope that answers the question. I've been doing it for three years. The, the knee itself has been out since 2014 for, for widespread use. Um, and, but I think there is some data, you know, going out to about 10 years with this knee, you know, through some of the docs who, who actually designed it. Awesome. Uh, the next question, how long does it take for the bone to grow into the implant? Um, so we, we follow these patients pretty closely. So we think around three months, maybe a little bit earlier, I typically see patients on a schedule. So we do the surgery, we bring them back in a, in a week to 10 days. Uh, we see them again, four weeks after surgery, we see them another, you know, six weeks later. And then at, at three months, each time they come in, we take x-rays so that we can kind of monitor these implants and make sure that they're not shifting or moving or, you know, showing any signs of loosening. And, uh, by three months, if we haven't seen movement in them, then we, we can, pretty much guarantee that they've, they've, you know, bit, had, had good bony, bony in growth and that they're stable. Um, here's one asking about pain during therapy. Do you have patients report a lot of pain during their therapy post knee replacement? Yes, uh, pretty much all of them. So it's a knee replacement is a, is a, you know, unfortunately it's a painful surgery and uh, not prohibitively so, but there, there's no such thing as, completely painless uh, knee replacement surgery. Now, now I will say there are outliers occasionally that, you know, the, the guy that comes in who says, Hey, I had knee replacement, you know, two weeks ago, I've taken one pain pill and I feel great and I don't have any pain. I, I will assure you that those are, you know, the outliers. Most people are going to have some pain and um, you're, you're going through physical therapy during a time when the knee really would, rather be left alone. It's, you know, it's had surgery, it's swollen, it's sore, um, but it's important. The therapy is, is critically important in getting a good result because we're trying to get the knee to bend and get your range of motion before scar tissue develops. Um, you know, we, we do our best to control pain with their, you know, pain medication and other medications and anti-inflammatories and, and, and different, different things to help with that. And, and most people get through it fine, but it is, um, there is some pain involved. 
so if someone has had a partial knee replacement, does that prohibit a total knee replacement? No, it uh, knee replacement or total knee replacement is done for partial knee replacements fairly frequently. So partial knee replacements um, have a higher uh, loosening rate or revision rate than total knee replacements, meaning a lot of those knees at some point will have to be revised for loosening. And in fact, I've, I've done a fair amount of that uh, with partial knees that have gotten loose. I don't do, I've done a few partial knees over the years. I just, I don't, in my practice, I don't see um, um, a lot of patients that I think are good candidates for it. Um, but yes, it can, the short answer is yes, partial knees are routinely converted to total knees, but they would need to be um, cemented knees because of the types of implants that we use. You can't revise a partial knee to a, a cementless knee. Very good. Okay. Um, if someone has been told they need both knees replaced, uh, do you often suggest that they do it at the same time, at different times, or what does that depend on? You know, I've done bilateral knees, <laughs> simultaneous bilateral knees, um, a fair amount. I did it you know, uh, certainly years ago, but I've, I've gotten to where I really recommend patients, unless they have really extreme circumstances, you know, if their, their insurance is running out or there's, there's something where they just have to do it, it can be done and they can get through it. But I think people do better if they sort of tackle this one at a time so they can really focus all their effort on getting the best result they can out of, out of one knee. Again, that doesn't mean that there aren't people out there who have both done, who said they had to, did, you know, did great and that's the way to go and, and sure it can be done. But, you know, there are also people out there who have both done and they're miserable with two knees that hurt and they go to therapy and they're, you know, they, they get through one knee and then they've got to start working on the other and they just, you know, it, it can be a, a grueling process if you try to tackle too much. Yes. Um, I have a question here. After knee replacement, can you actually kneel on it? You can. Um, we don't recommend it because of the the patellar component, the small the small component that goes behind the kneecap is really it's very small. And when you kneel on the kneecap, you're really concentrating a lot of force on that component. And so the the more of that that you do, the more the higher the risk of that component becoming loose or fracturing or, or, or you know or, or something going wrong with it. So you know, physically, can you do it? Sure. It's usually more painful than in a than in a, a native knee, a knee that hasn't had surgery. But I recommend to all of my patients that they avoid kneeling if they can, as much as you know, as much as possible. Excellent. Do you ever have patients that get the knee replacement without um, go using narcotic pain medicine? Yes, we've actually uh, with anesthesia at our at our uh, surgery center in Germantown. We've actually been. Uh, working with this and we've done a few total joint uh, procedures now where the patient gets no narcotics at all during surgery using di different medications. Um, another question is, is there any difference between cemented and cementless implants as far as stability after the surgery? I'm sorry, the, the sound broke up. I'm oh, sorry. Is there any difference between cemented and cementless implants as far as stability after the surgery? Uh, no. So our goal is to be, you know, complete stability of, of both. So the cement, once the cement cures, the, the cemented knee is stable. The, you know, as I was talking in the, the, the talk, one of the, the keys to a successful cementless knee is to get initial stability so that, that, that those implants are stable so the bone can grow into it. So, you know, our, our goal is to have equal stability for both of those types of implants. And another person has asked, can you expand on the quality of bone that is necessary for the surgery? Um, it's a little bit subjective. You know, it's a little bit when the doctors who do these uh, and are, are sort of do, do enough of them and see see different types of bone quality, you can pretty much tell what bone is what we call 
uh, you know, good bone quality versus what we would consider osteoporotic bone. So osteoporotic bone um, tends to be more porous and it is, is physically just soft. Sometimes you can just take your finger and kind of press against the bone and it'll, it'll sort of depress, you'll make a little depression in the bone where the bone just feels soft. And that's, that bone is not, you know, would not be uh, considered good enough quality to, um, to put a cementless in. Um, here's one of the questions that we received early on. Uh, can you use robotic assistance with the cementless knee replacement surgery? Yes, that is being done. Um, another question, how many years should a typical knee replacement last? Yeah, we get that question a lot, and it's a little bit hard to answer because, um, you know, you don't know how many years a, a new design knee is going to last until you get to the, the failure point. And so what we're really seeing right now are failures in previous generations of knees. So knees that were done, you know, 20 years ago or, or more, they're starting to fail. But, the, you know, that's 20-plus-year-old technology. So the, the newer knees with the newer... Uh, you know, there have been advances in a lot of areas, but one of the key advances is in the quality of that plastic spacer, the, the insert that goes between the, the metal components. And so that's playing a big role, we think, in the, the longevity of these newer, the newer knees. Um, you know, the knees, I, I've been in practice for 13 years and, and knock on wood, I've not had to revise any of the knees that I've done in that, those 13 years for, for loosening. Um, and so we're hoping that these knees are going to last 20 plus years, maybe more, but it's, it's really hard to sort of nail down and say, you know, it's going to last 22 years versus 20 years versus 19 years. It depends also on the, the patient, how active they are, how heavy they are, you know, how many, how many miles they put on the knee, so to speak. Great question. Uh, great answer. Great question too. Um, how long is a typical operation? and post-op recovery? Yeah, so the a cemented knee is, again, depending on a lot of factors, how much deformity is present, you know, the size of the patient. Um, a cemented knee is typically gonna be somewhere around, you know, maybe an hour to an hour and a half. A uh, cementless knee, maybe 45, 50 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes kind of would be a typical cementless knee. And then recovery was sort of kind of what we went over earlier about the, the phases, the two weeks and six weeks and you know nine months for full recovery kind of thing. Um, are there any pre-surgery exercises that a patient should do or things that they should try or make sure that they do before going into surgery? Yeah, I think, you know, it's going to be, the, the limits are going to be there based on how bad their arthritis is and what they can tolerate. But certainly we encourage patients to, to be, to remain as active as they can be, um, you know, maintain as much knee motion as they can, as much knee strength. So low impact exercises, I think like, like cycling, riding a bike, whether it's a stationary bike or a bike you ride out outside, um, that's very good exercise for the knee. It's low impact. It tends not to cause a lot of pain. It works on knee range of motion as well as strengthening some of the muscles around the knee, which are important for your recovery. So, you know, if I had to give someone one, you know, one thing to do, it would be cycling. I think that's a good one. Awesome. And it looks like we have an athlete here. Um, he says, I'm 64, still water ski. Um, would, my, would a knee replacement put a stop to that? Um, you know, it's probably not something that most doctors would recommend. Um, we tend to want people to sort of protect these as much as they can, just because we want them to last as long as possible. Um, how active patients are after surgery is really up to the patient in, in many respects. You know, our, our job as surgeons is to tell them what is, what are the risks, what are the risks of being, you know, too active, what can go wrong. You know, the more stress you put on these, the less, uh, uh, the less number of years you're going to get out of the knee, but people, people undergo this surgery for a lot of reasons. They want to get back to doing things that they can't do. And uh, they want to, you know, alleviate pain. They want to gain motion, lots of reasons, but my job is to sort of inform patients on what the risks are and then 
let patients, you know, make their own decision as to what level of activity they want to get back to. Um, someone asked if you have two knees that are are giving you trouble, do you suggest doing the most problematic knee first or the least problematic knee? I generally tell them just to whichever one hurts the most. And, and inch, that's an inch, brings up an interesting uh, uh, point. A lot of times we'll take x-rays of, you know, a person will come in and they've got two bad knees. We'll take x-rays and, and one will look terrible on x-ray and one will look bad, but not, not as bad as the terrible one. And they'll say, well, you know, this, this one that doesn't look so bad on x-ray is the one that hurts or hurts worse. And so I typically just tell patients, whichever one is giving you the most trouble, that's the one we need to do first and then uh, tackle the other one down the road. Um, now, for fo some folks here um, who might be already seeing other ortho South doctors, um, if they are there any other surgeons um, at ortho South who are also doing the cementless knee? Yes, there are several. Great. Not just me. Um, and is horseback riding stressful to knee replacement? Um, it does put a little bit of stress on knee replacement, I, but I don't, I have patients that, that ride horses. And I, don't, I don't prohibit them, them from doing that. Um, I have another question here that has popped up about, do we do robotic knee replacement at Ortho South? Uh, we do. We do have at least one physician that is doing uh, robotic knee replacement at one of the local hospitals. So, so to do the robotic surgery, you have to actually have the, the robot, which is a pretty expensive um, piece of equipment. Um, I've looked into it. I've done a little bit of training on the robot in, in partial knees and also in hip replacement. I have not done the full uh, knee robotic uh, training. Um, Partly because I'm just watching the, the studies, kind of like I did with the the cement uh, the cementless knees. I, you know, I tend to want to watch that for uh, a few years to see if there's utility. So it's it does add some expense to the case, and it does add some length to the case. And what I, what I want to be able to see is does that translate over the long term into a knee that actually does better? So if the answer is yes, if those knees are doing better and patients get a better outcome then yeah, it's, it's potentially worth the, the added expense. If on the other hand, you know, time shows that patients do exactly the same or no better than, than traditional ways of doing this surgery, it may, may show that um, that's not cost effective. Um, but the jury's still out on that. I haven't, I haven't uh, you know, made a personal decision on that yet. And I, I still think there's still some, uh, some more studying that needs to be done. This next question, I'm probably going to uh, mispronounce very easily. It says, do you use any tibia implants with hydroxyapatite coating? So HA coating, so the so yeah, this cementless, uh, you know, that's used in total hip and it's also used in some components with cementless total knee. Uh, that the, the tibial implant that I use is, is the one that we showed you, the striker one that, that has the porous uh, titanium. And you know, Stryker's not the only company that has that. There, there are some others that use uh, porous titanium, but you know, that's that's my preference. And I think the studies are sort of showing that that's the the one that gives us the best results. Right. Let's see if we've got any other here. Um, are there any reasons that so? Someone gets a knee replacement, they're a year and a half out, and it still hurts. Range of motion is good, but they're still in pain. Is that something that you see from time to time? And, and if so, what are some common causes? Yeah, so the painful total knee, it's, uh, it's something that all, all of us who do total joints see. Um, there, there are a lot of different causes uh, or potential causes for a painful knee. Um, you know, the, the, the studies show about 90% of people who have knee replacement are, are satisfied, which is a good number. So if you get 90% of people that are happy about anything, that's, that's a pretty good number. Um, the other 10% can have pain for a lot of reasons. So there can be, there can be problems with the components. The components can be loose or malpositioned. Um, it can be just from a lot of scar tissue in the knee. It can be from uh, an infection, unfortunately. Uh, you can have kind of a low-grade infection that causes pain uh, you know, in the knee. 
or you can have pain from other sources. So believe it or not, there are things, you know, a, a problem with the hip can cause pain primarily in the knee when the, you know, the, the primary problem is the hip, but it, it feels like the pain is in the knee. So you can have a situation where a knee replacement is done for a knee that has some arthritis, but not terrible arthritis, but really the, the arthritic hip can be causing that. Um, also, also a, uh, a back problem, a pinched nerve in the back can cause pain in the knee. So really that's one of the things that we, when we see a person who's had a previous knee replacement and it's, it's you know, a year out or whatever, still hurting, we sort of start a workup with, we do lab work, see is there any evidence of an infection? We'll do a, a bone scan to see if there's any evidence of, of something being loose and you know, some other things that we, we work through to try to sort that out. Well, everyone, unless there are any last um, last minute questions come in, and I think we have gotten to the end of our list, and it's great. Um, we're almost at a full hour, so I want to thank you, Dr. Ferguson, for your time. Thank you to everyone um, who hung in there and listened to this awesome presentation and stayed through all of the questions. Um, if I did not get to your question, there's Prob it's probably because it was a little too specific or wasn't quite on topic, but I will try to follow up with you at a later time with some information. Um, and if you have any additional questions, feel free to email us at mkandel at orthosouth.org and I will get you an answer. Um, everyone have a great evening and thank you again. Thank you.